Good evening and welcome to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, Illinois. My name is Joe Crane, Director of Public Programs here at the ALPLM. So glad to have you along on this, uh, what is turning out to be a toasty Thursday evening in central Illinois and across a good chunk of the Midwest as well. And I understand it's only going to get hotter this weekend. So folks, if you're planning a big Juneteenth celebration, a lot of folks now having the day off tomorrow with uh, between the state of Illinois declaring Juneteenth a uh, state holiday. And now today, President Biden, Biden signing into law the uh, proclamation that uh, tomorrow will be Juneteenth celebration nationwide. So an important date in our nation's history. And we're commemorating that tonight with a special program themed toward uh, the Juneteenth celebration. Of course, right now you can see the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Abraham Lincoln, one of about a dozen copies that still exist on display every day from 9 until 5 here at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum all the way through July 6th. Of course, uh, if you're looking to get tickets in advance to visit the museum, please do so. PresidentLincoln.Illinois.gov is where you can find ticket information. And with uh, the fact that we're now into phase five, Illinois fully open after the COVID pandemic, uh, you have the opportunity just to simply walk up and purchase your tickets uh, at the door as you come into the museum. But we still encourage folks to uh, get tickets in advance. That way you can get into the museum a lot faster to be able to see the incredible legacy of uh, President Lincoln that we share with the world here at the AOPLM. Tonight's program on Facebook Live entitled Pathways to Freedom, the Underground Railroad and the Illinois Freedom Project. Of course, we invite you to let us know where you're watching from around the state and around the country tonight in the comments section of Facebook. And as we go through the uh, next hour or so, if you have some questions for our gathered group of historians and experts, please post those in the comments as well, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. So to introduce the rest of our guests tonight on the panel, let's hand it over to our Illinois and Midwest Studies historians here at the ALPLM, Dr. Jacob K. Freefeld. Good evening, Jake. Thank you, Joe. It's uh, lovely being here again with you. I think I've spent uh, three nights with you on Facebook Live this month, and uh, I always love coming back. Um, and as you said, as we head into this Juneteenth uh, weekend, um, we thought we'd offer a program that deals with the Black Freedom Movement, but because the um, Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library is also the Illinois State Historic Library, we thought we'd focus more on the Black Freedom Movement in the Midwest and Illinois, uh, particularly before emancipation. And um, I've got two great people from the National Park Service with me uh, today. Um, Day Johnson, who is the uh, Midwest coordinator on the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Project. Um, and I always mess that up, and I I'm, hope I got it right this time. Um, and Tim Townsend from the Lincoln Home, who is also with the uh, Illinois Freedom Project. And I just want to thank both of you uh, for, for joining me and Joe on uh, Facebook Live tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having us, and I'm glad to join remotely. <laughs> <laughs> and it's working. Um, I think just to get us started, it might be useful to have uh, both of you, in, in whichever order you, you'd want, uh, to, to tell us a little bit about uh, your two projects that you're, you're working on. Go ahead, Dave. You want to start? So, I'm with the National Park Service's National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Program, and I hope some of you out there have heard of us before, but we were established in 1998, and we set and promote quality standards in the coordination of education, preservation, and commemoration efforts related to the history of the Underground Railroad, which the program defines as resistance to enslavement through escape and flight. And the Underground Railroad, you know, some people say, oh, the Underground Railroad was in operation from the 1830s to the Civil War, but the way that we look at it is the Underground Railroad was in operation from the earliest times people were enslaved until the passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865, which abolished slavery. The movement includes those who escape, which we refer to as freedom seekers, and those who assisted them in their efforts. We consider it the nation's first civil rights movement. And part of the network is that we have a, what we call the Network to Freedom, which is a listing of sites, facilities, and programs which have a verifiable association with the Underground Railroad. Currently, there are over 680 Network to Freedom listings in 39 states, plus Washington, D.C., and the Virgin Islands. Um, the sites are what we call, those are the actual places associated with the Underground Railroad history. Then we have programs which interpret and educate about the history of the Underground Railroad. Then we have facilities. 
which probably the Abraham Lincoln Library and Museum should be one, but they currently aren't. So this is my shameless plug to try to get you guys listed, um, which contain kind of the documentary resources that can further our understanding of this important history. Um, if you look at slot, the, slot, the slide two, which looks at the state, you'll notice that Illinois has currently 25 listings. As you could well know, probably everybody who's listening knows that's not necessarily indicative of the rich history that um, Illinois has regarding the Underground Railroad. There should be a lot more. Um, I just mentioned one. I won't mention all of them because that's a discussion for another day. But I really think Illinois should be better represented for its um, important history to the Underground Railroad and in telling what we consider to be an important migration story. And I'll let Tim talk a little bit about the Illinois Freedom Project now. Thanks, Jane. Thanks uh, for having me as part of this program. It's always a pleasure to be in this facility with you guys. And any time to work with my colleague, Day, is, is great. Um, so the Illinois Freedom Project is, is a, a program that really came out of, I'm going to jump ahead here, um, of what I learned in, in researching Jameson Jenkins, who was a conductor on the Underground Railroad, he was a neighbor of Lincoln's, lived just down the street, didn't really know too much about him, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, but one of the first things we did was um, get the Jenkins lot, the house no longer stands, but the Jenkins lot included in the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. And, and so in wanting to learn more about Jenkins, and I'm, I'm an Illinois native, grew up in a little town of Stockton up in Joe Davis County, and there's so much of this African-American history in Illinois that I didn't know growing up, you know, and, and, and I thought it was problematic that I knew Lincoln's shoe size, but I didn't know that there were such things as black codes in Illinois, for example. <laughs> and, and so we jumped in to, you know, starting with, research um, and and pulling together the stories and it's just skimming the surface and everything from when the French first introduced slavery uh, into the Illinois country on up through Chicago and Bronzeville and the Great Migration and everything in between. So we pulled together the research. Then we worked on um, a, a website to present the information and, and printed materials. And we've always worked with young people um, in presenting history, but we really were intentional about presenting this African American history, working with folks like Justin Blanford over at the old state capitol. And so we put together some videos to go on the, with the web page. And then, uh, working with youth mentoring organizations from throughout Springfield, like the Boys and Girls Club and the Outlet and many others, we loaded up a charter bus and, and went on a trip throughout Illinois to visit some of these Illinois Freedom locations. So. Uh, and it's an ongoing effort. It's an ongoing project to, to explore, experience, and get to the relevancy of these stories to today. And what does this research look like? You're doing most of that at the Lincoln home, or is it broader? Than it's, it's broader. It's much broader. You know, the, at, with national parks or any historic sites, you really end up really tightly focused, you know, on a particular uh, story. For us, of course, it's the Lincoln family in the 17 years they lived at the home, but which is a very important story, but we broadened that out and, and uh, not only thematically, but also in the research and the facilities that we visited to pull together that, that research, you know, relying a lot on secondary sources as well. And is, just to go back for a second, you mentioned the Jenkins home isn't standing anymore. Right. Is there any, do, you, do you know what it looks like? And is there any movement to maybe replicate it? Yeah, well, we... We worked, we partnered with the Illinois State Museum mm -hmm. and the good folks there and did three summer seasons doing archaeological testing of the site and um, confirmed what we thought we knew through other document uh, maps and other documents of what the house may have looked like. Um, and then we worked with uh, a gentleman by the name of John Amakawa to develop an augmented reality virtual tour of the lot to put the house back. People can look through their phone or their tablet and virtually the house is back and with little vignettes. And, and maybe someday we'll reconstruct the structure itself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's part of the, the challenge of, of these stories is so often the places associated with these stories don't exist. And there aren't those substantial homes. And, and, and so often with, with 
cultural resources, as we call it, and what the Park Service does in the state with historic sites, it's what's left. So we have to be more intentional, I think, about representing and uh, telling the stories of, of uh, people whose homes no longer exist or the event, the structures no longer exist related to them. Yeah, let's, let's get into some of those um, stories and places. Because um, I, I think when a lot of people think of the Underground Railroad, um, they think of these bastions of abolitionism, um, perhaps New England, some routes that go east and then into Canada. Um, what would the Underground Railroad have looked like in the Midwest and Illinois? What are some of the sites? And maybe even, <laughs> either you could speak to, uh, when we think railroad, we think stops with like schedules. Is, is that the case or is it more improv improvisational than that? Yeah. It's like a four-part oh. question. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of that question. Um, so with the Midwest, what, so of course people like to think of New England and Canada, but as, if you look at that um, map of underground railroad routes, right, the underground railroad not only went north, it went um, west, it went south, you know, it went everywhere. Um, and it really, sometimes it really was kind of what opportunities were available? It's not like you had a um, route. You know, one of my favorite stories is there's a story of um, these three tunnels, right? People always like the tunnels, these secret hiding places. There's three tunnels in upstate New York. And everybody said they're, they were used on the Underground Railroad. And it was like, well, well, how were they used? Did they have like signs that said, okay, if your name is A through M, you go through this tunnel, if your name, you know what I mean? Because they were all just right next to each other. So people kind of have that conception, but really it was about a lot of times when people provided underground railroad assistance, it's not like they necessarily planned to, they were faced with it in a moment with someone needing assistance and they had to make that decision whether or not to help that person. Now, over time, we know that the underground railroad did get increasingly more deliberate, particularly as it moved west to the Midwest and even further west. And so then you get to see more deliberation. And we see that it's really a migration story because if you look at some of the counties in Illinois, they'll say we trace our underground railroad involvement to the migration of people from a community in Ohio that was very involved in the underground railroad. Um, so we see it becoming increasingly deliberate and about people moving out and, you know, they're not moving necessarily for the Underground Railroad, but of course, if they were committed to this anti-slavery struggle, they would have brought it with them wherever they uh, migrated to. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the story of the Underground Railroad in the Midwest, particularly since you have people migrating out. It's often not necessarily looking, you know, when you're looking at someone's Underground Railroad activity, it's not necessarily looking about what happened, particularly in that location. It's looking about where they migrated from and where they migrated to. It's a much larger story than we like to talk about. And I think sometimes, you know, when we're looking about Underground Railroad, we get so locked into our location, right, where we live or where we're located. But really, the Underground Railroad, because it's a migration story, you can't understand it without understanding where people are going, coming from and going to. It's not like the enslaved people who escaped started off in your place. They had to come from somewhere, and they usually, sometimes they did settle in these communities, but most often they went to someplace else. So we really don't have a true understanding of the Underground Railroad unless we look at this larger migration. Um, and so I think that's one of the things. Did I answer all your questions? I know there was a lot in there. <laughs> yeah, I think you did a really good job. Yeah. Um, so within that migration, then, um, where, where are folks in Il who are coming through Illinois and where are they ending up? I, based on the map, it looks like maybe Michigan. I, I'm a little bit farther from the map. <laughs> the yeah. Folks so so people go from Illinois to Michigan. It just depends where, you know, where, where they happen to be. And sometimes if slave traders in the area, they're going to have to be um, flexible, right? Fluid with the th decisions where they might decide, okay, I was planning to go north, but now I'll need to go um, deviate um, a little bit more west and then go back east. But there's different, sometimes people start off in Illinois, took detours through Indiana. It's very weird sometimes the way that things happened um, in the Underground Railroad. Um, and we know, you know, we call it the Underground Railroad. And sometimes people go, well, it wasn't Underground Railroad. It wasn't underground, nor was it a railroad. But people, the railroads were so important to Illinois' underground railroad story. And I think that's something that gets missed, um, that people were using the actual railroads in their, uh, their journeys and to go in their travel to get from one place to another. That's incredible. I've seen a couple stories about steamboats as well um, being important, the, that second nature system of mastering the, the rivers and 
um, the railroads. Uh, now, what, what sites um, in Illinois are we talking about that would be important? Um, well, there's several, but um, one of the one of the ones that we look at that's kind of a traditional, what people traditionally think about as Underground Railroad is the Richard L's house. And I'm sorry that I spelled his name wrong on the slide. <laughs> it should be two E's and two L's. But he was a doctor there in Quincy, Illinois, which was kind of a stronghold of abolitionist activity. And in 1842, um, an enslaved man named Charlie crossed over from Missouri into Illinois, and he was brought to um, Richard L's house by a free African American man. And Richard L's and um, the freedom seeker ended up getting um, caught. And Richard L's was actually prosecuted for his involvement in the Underground Railroad. Um, the case went to court. And um, Stephen Douglas was the judge in that case, for those of you Lincoln fans out there. He was fined $400. He appealed the case first to the state Supreme Court, and the case ended up going all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. But unfortunately, before the case was heard before the U.S. Supreme Court, um, Dr. Ells had died. Um, but that was kind of one of the, that's kind of what we think of like these houses right of these people and they were involved in the underground railroad they provided safe houses or they were conductors and they helped to trans people help transfer people to the next stop but one of the things that we like to try to focus on because even you see this in um, the Richard L story is that free African Americans were essential to the operations of the Underground Railroad. So what, that's one of the things that we try to do in getting these stories out is to talk about African American involvement. Um, and people don't realize that oftentimes that was kind of the front line of defense. When um, freedom seekers came into different states, quote, free states, they first relied on people of color. And then people of color would put them into contact with sympathetic people who could help them on the rest of their journeys. Um, and so we see places like um, free African-American communities like um, New Philadelphia, which you see pictured there. Um, and that was founded in 1836. It was the first town that was um, legally registered by an African-American. Um, and he not only was he instrumental in gaining his own freedom, but he eventually helped to gain um, the freedom of 16 of his family members. But the town was also active on the Underground Railroad. And um, New Philadelphia shares kind of a lot of characteristics of what we consider kind of free African-American communities that were involved in the Underground Railroad. They were a remote landscape, proximity to a river or a slave state, in this case, Missouri. Um, and they were often located on not only the border between a slave and a free state, but they were also located in borderlands of, of the county where they're located. So they're lo located usually between two counties. And we see this in places like not only New Philadelphia, but Rocky Fork, Brooklyn, and Miller Grove, which are all there um, in Illinois. Um, and what's interesting, I know when we focus on African Americans involvement in the Underground Railroad, we're not trying to discount white participation, but what we're trying to do is to broaden the story because it helps us better understand what was a complex and nuanced movement. And it was a grassroots movement. And we have people you know, uniting across lines of race, gender, religion, and class, and they were all uniting in the hopes of, of promoting social change. But often when we think about the Underground Railroad, we think of traditionally, right, it, we construct it in terms of kind of white benevolence. And people of African descent are considered passive recipients of the movement. And so they're often nameless and faces, except a few, of course, like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. And what happens is that African Americans or people of African descent became secondary characters in what was a, largely a story about their own, their struggles for freedom and self-determination. And this got caught up in kind of that post-Civil War narrative of freedom emancipation being a gift and not something that was earned and fought for by people of African descent. So we always try to talk about African-American agency, both of the freedom seekers making that often difficult decision to flee bondage, but also those who assisted them on their journeys. How difficult is it to do that? Uh, because I mean, a lot of the sources, because in, in our own collection, we have um, an account of uh, an Underground Railroad account, I think written by Julius Willard, uh, who, who helped someone uh, to, to freedom and then was fined much like um, Ells was. Uh, but again, that's a, a source written by a, a white guy after the fact. When a lot of the, 
the writing about this stuff is from the, the white participants. How difficult is it to find and recover the, those black voices in, in the Underground Railroad? It is difficult, of course. But what's interesting is when we see a lot of those stories, like the one you mentioned um, by Willard, that a lot of them are, in a way, they're talking about the Black people who were involved in the Underground Railroad. Now, normally the freedom seekers remain kind of nameless and faceless, you know, in those stories, but they are talking about people of color in their communities that were instrumental. I'm thinking, if you look at some of the Siebert papers, they talk about a free African-American man who lived nearby that helped and assisted people. So you do get those, and we do know the name of the person, um, the free African-American man that helped else. So they are there in different ways. And sometimes, you know, people often think the Underground Railroad happened in secret, so we can't know about it. But there's a lot more information than we think that is out there. And it's really about kind of, um, corroborating your sources. Sometimes a lot of census information is important. Looking at, well, who are the free blacks there in the community? Who could this be when you see an account referred to someone like that? Um, and it's often, you know, the Underground Railroad is about connections, right? Think about, you're involved in kind of an illicit secret activity. Who are you going to trust? You're going to trust people that you already have established bonds with. So these relationships exist through church, um, through different societies, usually through your business relationships, um, people who you knew in towns like that you migrated from, right? And their extended family members. Even when we look at someone like John Brown, right? If we look at those who he depended on in his activities on the Underground Railroad, they're most likely either relatives or people that he knew back from when he migrated from New York or Ohio or they're kind of um, his extended family members on either his mother or father's side. So really, you know, the reason we call it the network to freedom is because it really is about a network of people working together and those relationships and established ties are so important in understanding those. So looking at, oh, you know, sometimes you hear one name of a person, but then you've got to look, you kind of have to do a genealogy of the Underground Railroad to really get at it, to say, how are these people related? Are they involved in the same church? Did they come from the same place? Those all become instrumental and in kind of what we call triangulating the data, right? You have this one story, right? People think, oh, it's a crazy Underground Railroad story. And there might be some crazy elements in some of these Underground Railroad stories you hear, but by digging down and kind of looking for kind of those those specific elements and then di diving deeper into those, we really are able to come up with a rich Underground Railroad history that starts really destroying some of the myth and getting at the true Underground Railroad story, which is a story about people. So I know people are always looking for a tunnel or a secret hiding place or a trap door. I always tell people it's not about those, those kind of architectural details, as exciting as they may be. It's really a story about people. And it's only when we get to the story of those people that we really truly understand the Underground Railroad. Uh, and so speaking of those people, I mean, we have the, the connection to the uh, Jameson Jenkins house, who's he's a, a middle class um, black, almost neighbor of Lincoln's. Right. And so where, where does where does that site fit in this network? And that's for either of you, because I know we're talking about both the network and the Lincoln home site. <laughs> well, um, and, and they jump in. Uh, but but, you know, Jenkins is a good example of that connection. There's also his in-laws, the Blanks family came from in the mid-1830s, mid to late 1830s, from North Carolina through southern Indiana, the Beach Settlement, then into Illinois, North Carolina's constitution was changing to where free blacks would need to get out of there, <laughs> even though it was a slave state, you know, to Illinois. And, um, and then there, those connections um, were, were built, I think, through that. There were others that came from North Carolina, people like John Jones, and then the Blanks family ended up up in Chicago. Um, they were they were uh, advocating f while they were still in Springfield for for uh, access to education for African American children. While Jenkins was associated with you know the Underground Railroad, and then the Blanks moved up to Chicago before the Civil War, and were also advocates for African American rights and. In, in, so those connections were there as well. And then we know um, in New Philadelphia, there are people also that came from North Carolina, the Beach Settlement to New Philadelphia. So those connections, I think, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just there. It's amazing how many, uh, to me anyway, just within the circle, the, the Lincoln Research Circle, you have people like John Jones, Jenkins, Blanks, um, uh, Reverend Brown, who who 
worked for the Lincolns or all had that North Carolina connection. So there's something more there yet, I think, that, and Day and I have talked about this, more research needs to be done mm-hmm. in that area as well. And Lincoln, yeah, and Lincoln's interesting too because he's surrounded right by these abolitionist folks, and but it keeps keeps the movement at arm's, arm's length. Um, uh, objects when the legislature tries to um, denounce abolitionism, but um, not stren- not strenuously. Right. Um, right. Do we have any questions from the audience yet, Joe? Not at this point, but I will add we have a lot of folks watching from all over Illinois and from uh, around the country as well. Seeing viewers tonight, uh, not only from throughout Illinois, but Indiana, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, a couple of different folks from Florida. Uh, looks like Des Moines, Iowa checking in with us tonight, as are uh, some folks from uh, numerous communities, including the Chicago area here throughout the state. One of the coolest comments, uh, Kelly said she's watching with the uh, eight-year-old granddaughter from Florida, originally from Illinois, loves history. That's what we like to see in a program like this, the opportunity to share such incredible history with such young people that are uh, becoming uh, aware of uh, of their past and uh, and hopefully making a better future. We do invite folks to let us know where you're watching from tonight throughout the state and across the country, even around the world. Just uh, comment in the section below. Of course, if you have a question for any of our historians tonight, uh, please uh, let us know in the comments and we'll uh, pass those comments and questions along as soon as we can. Now there are a few different ways I think we could turn here. Uh, we could just keep talking about sites, but I think there's a a subtext going going through this right now where we're talking about folks fleeing to Illinois um, as if Illinois at this like in the 1830s, 40s, 50s is this bastion of freedom. Um, what's going on? Because I mean, people are getting fined, right, for helping people escape um, uh, slavery. So, so what's going on in Illinois? And um, is is this is this one way traffic on the Underground Railroad? Well, how much tension is there in the state? So I I think all states are complicated when we talk about the Underground Railroad, of course. You know, Illinois became a destination on the Underground Railroad because dating back to the Northwest Ordinance, um, which prohibited slavery from existing in its borders. But we know slavery existed within Illinois, right? From um, From colonial times, both under the French and the British, slavery existed. Um, Both people of Native American descent and African descent were enslaved um, in Illinois. So I think sometimes when we're talking about slavery, we create this kind of false construction, right? South slave, North free, but these simple narratives kind of distort the history. Slavery existed practically everywhere um, in the North, South, East, and West in Illinois. Um, And I think one of the things that people, people had vested interests in slavery in Illinois, right? Even if Illinois was not a slave state. And we know that people held people in bondage in Illinois up until the 1840s. And we have um, two of the sites that we could show is one is the Knox County, Illinois um, site, which was associated with um, some legal proceedings that stemmed from an 1842 escape from Randolph County, in which a man named Andrews Borders was holding Um, people of African descent in bondage, and they escaped on the Underground Railroad, made their way to Knox County, where they were assisted by abolitionists, and he came up um, to reclaim his enslaved property. So we see people holding slaves, them escaping, and them still being able to reclaim them in Illinois, despite it being a free state. And, you know, if we look at the um, Crenshaw House, the old slave house there in Gallatin County, right? the man there, Crenshaw, had a vested interest. He was a businessman there in Southern Illinois. And he was involved in not only slave trading, but he was kidnapping free blacks. And that kind of deals with kind of the liminal position of free blacks, even though they're free because of kind of the complex racism that existed, they they weren't completely free, right? And even before the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, you see free Blacks being kidnapped and being taken back down South. And Crenshaw was um, implicated twice in the 1820s and 1840s for kidnapping free Blacks and, and trading them essentially deeper South. And so I think, you know, it was always dangerous for free Blacks there in Illinois, um, even though there was a lot of, you know, anti-slavery activity, but because of kind of the complex notions about race and just by, you know, your race, you could, 
and being a person of color, you were assumed that you could be a slave. And so, and you could not testify in court. So let's say you were arrested as a free person, it would be very hard for you to prove your freedom. So it really depended on um, sympathetic whites coming to your aid in order to help protect that freedom that you had fought and earned. Um, and so I think it's, you know, we have to think about Illinois. Yes, it was this, um, quote, free state, but there were a lot of kind of complications and nuances to that idea of it being a free state. Yeah, and yeah, a lot of times folks are held as indentured servants, right? But they're technically still enslaved until um, in the 1848 uh, Constitution eventually uh, makes that illegal. Unless you're a prisoner, right? There's still this, this wiggle room within that Constitution as well. I think we have a question from the audience. Yes, uh, several actually coming in, and we can kind of uh, uh, sprinkle these in. But uh, Margaret wants to know, what is the history of Shawneetown and the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in the Underground Railroad? Ooh, what county is that in? That's in uh, Gallatin County, down in uh, southeastern Illinois, right along the Ohio River. Oh, so in the same county where the slave house is? Yes, house. yes, yes. I don't know much about that particular site. Um, I would love to know more, and if there, if it should be listed in the network, I would love to see it represented. I don't know much about that site. Good. Well, I, and I'm not, I'm not sure either on the specific site, but also not too far from, you know, the Crenshaw House in Shawnee Town is Miller Grove in Shawnee National Forest, which was an African American community. Um, as Day indicated, with just like New Philadelphia, it was near the Ohio River, and it was a, a small but vibrant African American community that certainly must have assisted as well with folks uh, traveling further north um, along the Underground Railroad. But but that Shawnee Town, uh, I'm just not uh, specifically sure either. It's it's interesting that it is a Presbyterian site because right that's very much part of this revolution in the mind of. Uh, Americans changed their minds on slavery at this time as the Second Great Awakening and people starting to reconsider as part of reform movements, um, things like uh, alcohol, but as well as uh, slavery. Um, and so it's not surprising to me that that might, that might be a site that would be yeah. Uh, important. Yeah, there's definitely certain kind of religious affiliations that you always go, oh, if you hear about them, it piques your interest. So Presbyterian, Congregationalists, um, United Church of the Brethren, um, of course, Quakers, the Friends. Um, so there's several. Um, the Free Baptists are another one, and they're quite popular there in Illinois. And I think there was a, a Free uh, um, Baptist Church near Barrie, Illinois, which is where New Philadelphia was associated with. And um, the War McWhorters were part of that congregation. So there's certain kind of religious denominations that you hear um, that you're like, oh, there's a good chance. I, I wouldn't throw it out the window, but more investigation would be needed to show that there was a definite connection with the Underground Railroad. So I would love to hear more about that um, community and see if we can see if that there is any documentation for them being involved in the Underground Railroad. Do you all often find that, the, that these sacred sites are important um, in these networks to freedom? Definitely. Um, and, you know, I mentioned white congregations, but um, the AME church was essential to Underground Railroad operations. And I think we have um, a couple of AME churches um, pictured there in the slideshow. First in Quincy with... Um, Mother Priscilla Baltimore, who, you know, she was a, a formerly enslaved woman who gained her freedom. She worked on the Underground Railroad. The church is actually believed to have been built on her property where, where her house stood and it was believed to be in her basement where she hid freedom seekers. Um, but you, it's hard pressed to find an AME church that was not involved in the Underground Railroad. And then, um, I don't know if you guys know Dr. Cheryl LaWurst. She's She believes that the AME church, uh, particularly with um, Bishop um, William Paul Quinn's West is essential to the spreading of underground railroad activities um, throughout black churches um, um, east of uh, east of Pennsylvania. Yeah. I mean, west of Pennsylvania. Sorry, I said east of Pennsylvania. West of Pennsylvania. It's not much, not much uh, real estate east of uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I do a lot of studying of uh, black towns in the West post Civil War. And I, it strikes me that the AME Church is usually the first, um, the first building to go up in, in a lot of those towns. Uh, I think I think we have more questions, Joe. Yes, yeah. indeed. Shirley uh, wants to know: Did anyone traveling on the railroad have a leader, or did some go alone, make a just a trip by themselves on the Underground Railroad? So, 
when we think of the typical freedom seeker, right, it's a young man traveling alone. Um, but we're, we're finding more and more things to take away from that history. That's why um, I guess I'll talk about the Slave Stampede Project now, because that kind of fits into what we're talking about, ways that we start to depart from kind of these traditional narratives, that we find that more and more that a lot of group escapes were, group escapes were important. And so we started a project working with Dickinson College there in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, looking at these larger group escapes because after certain points in time, group escapes are actually more popular than kind of the single escape um, traveling alone. And of course, there's all kinds of implications, right, from traveling with a group. You're not as, um, <laughs> you're kind of not as, um, you're more conspicuous. Um, usually there were women and children in that. Um, and uh, we all know, um, particularly you parents out there that traveling with children is not an easy thing. And imagine if you are in such a precarious situation trying to travel with children, keep them quiet and keep them fed. But these escapes were more and more popular um, during, um, we see more discussion of them in the eight, late 1840s. And at the same time, when we start to see more discussion of these larger escapes, we also start to see what, what we see, a push for stronger enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Law, which ultimately culminates in the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. It strikes me that the, the, the term stampede strikes me as somewhat dehumanizing, right? Where does that term, where did that come from? So it's interesting that the term slave stampede enters into the American lexicon almost very soon after the term stampede enters into the American lexicon, right? It enters in the 1840s when there's an expansion out west. It's believed to have Spanish or Germanic roots. Um, and so it just begins in the that 19th century to talk about enslaved people escaping in groups or several escapes from uh, the same location in a, in a, sh a kind of a finite space and time. Um, I don't find like, of course, right, the term stampede conjures up images of uncontrolled and frightened animals, but I don't think it is necessarily derogatory because we see it being used in newspapers in all sorts of ways. Um, there's a stampede of, you know, people from a certain political party. So that word is just used to kind of uh, refer to any group of people. But I, I definitely understand people's first <laughs> thing to go when you're talking about enslaved people and then using a term that likens them to animals to thinking it's derogatory. But I'm just not finding that's necessarily the case so far. And neither has um, Dr. Pinsker, who is the principal investigator on the project. Um, but these escapes are very interesting and they receive national attention they really become enmeshed in political debates regarding slavery and freedom. And you see them being used for by both sides, right? Anti-slavery people are using this to kind of detract from these ideas about slavery being a, a positive benefit and a paternalistic system because there is nothing more contrast that people aren't happy than a whole bunch of people getting up and <laughs> escaping at one time. And so it really contradicted kind of these notions about the contented enslaved person. And we see it being used to apply to as few as three to upwards of 100 people escaping at the same time. And of course, you know, what's the most interesting thing about these stampedes is they're a borderland phenomenon before the Civil War. They usually happen from borderland states and from border, uh, from border communities within borderland states. Um, and so we know that, you know, borders created unique um, prospects for escape and flight, and it was often about proximity, right? Escaping was about having that moment to escape. It, of course, involved careful planning, and particularly when you're escaping in a group, but it really was that those moments of that proximity to being to um, near free states like Illinois, Ohio, um, Iowa, all those things, that's what um, really made those escapes possible because it's a lot harder to travel with a big group from the deep south to the north than it is to travel from a borderland community where you just have to cross the river and then you're into quote a free state and um jameson jenkins the event he was involved with in 1850 was was reported in the springfield papers as a slave stampede the numbers vary 11 to 14 or so from St. Louis on up through. So the Jenkins pro the J Jameson Jenkins is part of this larger slave stampede and, study. And how so how does Jenkins go about then helping 14 people because again it's conspicuous, right? Right. Well, it, he was he his uh, line of work was a drayman, so mm -hmm. he was a teamster, he hauled goods for a living. So that was 
I think there was someone else in uh, someone in Jacksonville who was also associated with the Underground Railroad, who's also a drayman. So that was a, a good line of work to be in if you mm -hmm. want to do those kinds of things. And they had mentioned earlier how this was not quite always as secretive as what we think with the Underground Railroad. And Jenkins was identified in the paper um, as being associated with with this event. Um, a little confused in, in his association with it, but. Um, so he uh, helped th the destination, the more immediate destination was Bloomington, and from there then maybe there was others that helped that group get further, uh, further north. Now, not all of that group made it. Some were, mm -hmm. were taken back to St. Louis, um, but, but some did. And do we know if Jenkins was ever prosecuted in his involvement? There's mm -hmm. no record of that. Oh. Mm -mm. No. Interesting. Uh, Joe, any other questions? Yes, uh, we invite, continue to invite your questions here. We're uh, with you here on this Thursday evening from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum talking about the Underground Railroad and the Illinois Freedom Project. Uh, Bill checking in with us tonight, uh, a question that I'm sure some people are thinking about. What kept Lincoln from supporting abolitionism in the 1840s and 1850s? Jake, do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, got the, I got you from the Lincoln home here. <laughs> um, uh, we could both tackle it. Um, part of it is um, he's a politician in Illinois where abolitionism isn't popular, right? He's not going to end his career. So he, he's doing this delicate dance. So he, he, con he condemns the vote that condemns abolitionism, but also within the statement... Um, Keeps abolitionists, uh, criticizes abolitionism and keeps them at arm's length in the 1830s. Um, so he, he's doing this dance both against slavery but not abolitionism, and he, he continues to do that dance all the way up and until his election when he says he has no intention of touching um, slavery where it currently exists. Yeah. He, uh, he, of course, very much adhered to the rule of law and felt that the institution, even though he didn't care much for it at all, was protected by the Constitution, and only through the Constitution could slavery end. And I think he further felt that if it was contained into those states where it already existed, not allowed to expand into the Western territories, it would end on its own. Now, we're looking back on, on Lincoln's positions here. We, don't, we cringe a little bit sometimes in, in how he felt, but he had to, as Jake said, you know, navigate a, a political climate here, especially in Illinois, as we've heard, that was very much a mixed bag. Um, and, and so then, then the events of, of the war as President Lincoln, then, then he, he moved further on. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a mixed bag in Illinois. In, in Alton, Illinois, Elijah Lovejoy in 1837 has, has three printing presses thrown in the river, and then he's shot, he, well, he's shot trying to defend the third one. Um, and, and Lincoln, in his Lyceum speech in 38, that is, mentions... Um, that he is, he is vehemently against uh, people being having their printing presses thrown in the river and being shot at. It clearly mentioned, uh, referring to Lovejoy. Um, but yeah, Illinois a mixed bag. Almost puts it uh, mildly. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have uh, Mary checking in, wanting to know if uh, any of you have uh, heard of or, or know the story of Father Augustine Tolton in Quincy. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I begin? Yeah, oh, don't get day started. On, uh... Let's get day started. <laughs> oh, so that is a site when I said there's only 25 listed in Illinois that I would definitely like to see represented. I think that's such an important story that not many people know of about the, the first um, African-American priest um, and here in the United States. And he, ex him and his family escaped during the the Civil War and made it to Quincy, Illinois. And so I think it's an important story and, you know, he's up for canonization. So what, you know, it connects so many different things on the Underground Railroad. So I would love to see it represented. I have had a few uh, starts and stops with people willing to work on applications. And then there's a question of whether his burial, which is there in Quincy, will be moved to someplace else. So that also um, sometimes, um, is an obstacle to us getting it um, listed, but it's such an important site. I would also like to see the um, farm where he escaped from in Missouri, um, near outside of Hannibal listed. Um, so that is what, you know, and I think that's one of the things that people don't understand. The Underground Railroad continued during the Civil War, right? Even though we, we hear the Emancipation Proclamation, right? 
And, you know, it wasn't like, it was by um, words rather than means. People still found the need to escape. And, you know, living in Missouri, which was a, not a state that was in rebellion, we still see those people would have still needed to escape on the Underground Railroad. So I think the Underground Railroad, even there's more Underground Railroad activity during the Civil War because there's more opportunities with um, the union, um, union encampments, people being able to flee um, by union lines. And even we have a story there in Elgin. I don't know that many people know this story, that during the Civil War, that people were working, there were what they called contraband trains that were sent throughout um, Illinois, where there were sympathetic soldiers who were working in the South. They saw the kind of the horrible conditions that were there in the contraband camps. And I think it was Stanton that arranged for trains and the Illinois um, Central train was used to um, transport people who had escaped um, to Union lines up to Illinois, and their labor was needed because, guess what, a lot of the men have were fight, away with fighting in war, so they provided important labor. So one of those um, stops where two boxcars were transported to Elgin, in Illinois, and they were able to, 110 people um, were transported by train to Elgin, Illinois. That's kind of the development and kind of proliferation of the African-American community there. And one of the sites listed in the network is actually the site where the church that the, those um, freedom seekers established there in Elgin was located, which is now a park called Newsom Park, which kind of is a commemoration to not only that story, but the larger story of African-Americans in Elgin. We have uh, John Henry tonight watching from uh, Gary, Indiana, and uh, says uh, each of us are all invited to attend the U.S. President Abraham Lincoln Floral Remembrance Ceremony coming up Saturday, July 17th at 1 p.m. at the Lincoln Tomb uh, State Historic Site here in Springfield. So that's coming up on July 17th. But he also has a question. You mentioned Elgin is up in the Chicagoland area, asking, are, were there any underground railroad sites between Chicago and Springfield, kind of in the, what you think of the I-55 corridor, such a prominent, was first a rail line linking St. Louis to Chicago with Springfield in the middle, and of course Bloomington, also prominent, and, and Route 66, later I-55, developed along that corridor. Were there any locations on the Underground Railroad and such, what we think of as such a, a crucial transportation link in Illinois? Yeah, well, I'm glad we got that question. I think uh, we should end that question with Chicago as well, because I don't think we've gotten to Chicago yet, and that's an incredibly important uh, a spot. Um, but I'll, I'll let Day take it. Yeah. Of course, there stops all along the way. I'm, try I'm trying to, like, geographically orient myself to kind of list some of the stops, and I'm just, I'm blanking right now. But I know there are stops that are in between maybe... Tim can help me um, right now fill in some of those. Yeah, was, wasn't um, a, another important place was Wheaton College, I think. Um, Sacred and, spaces again. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, Wheaton College was definitely an important stop there. We also have, um, oh, why am I blanking on? It's in Will County. Um, Will County had several different, there was the Sheldon Peck House. Um, up that way, that was a stop on the Underground Railroad. So, of course, there had to be stops because people have to get, you know, north. And so that would be, um, and if you go um, west, there's, of course, Knox County. And sometimes people took, you know, different routes to get up to Chicago and different um, places. But, yeah, there definitely was some routes. There's definitely a lot in Chicagoland. One of the sites that was recently listed, which we don't hear a lot of, um, about, are the involvement of the Dutch there. And there was a farm called the Tun Farm. It's no longer standing. Um, but the Dutch were very important in the Chicago land. There was a, not only the Tan family, but the, the Kuiper family was very involved in the Underground Railroad. They were a um, family of Dutch immigrants that had moved to the Chicago area. So I think, you know, sometimes we're limited in how we think about what people were involved in the Underground Railroad, but there's so many more stories of different groups that were involved in the Underground Railroad. Great. Joe, are there any other audience questions? No, no we're good right now. Uh, then let's, let's get to a question that, that I was hoping I'd get to ask. Um, right now, I believe streaming, um, possibly on, on one of the streaming services, is a uh, TV show about the Underground Railroad, which I think... And I'm not going to spoil anything because I haven't seen an episode of it yet. Um, but I believe it's fictionalized as an actual railroad. But I would want to talk more broadly about depictions of the Underground Railroad in popular culture. Um, do you think some of the misconceptions folks in general have about the Underground Railroad come from those popular cultural representations? 
Yes, most definitely. <laughs> um, popular culture is kind of one of our first ways that we learn about history. And of course, you know, as much as I would like to say that, you know, oh, for those of you who have read Underground Railroad, it's a great book. And I think, you know, there there's a historical inaccuracies in everything in popular culture. I mean, even Batman's, I, for those of you who are Batman fans, right, Wayne Manor is supposedly built over a cave that was used on the Underground Railroad. But I don't get, even as a historian, I don't get bought, I'm not too unhappy about popular culture depiction because I think they do something that we as historians aren't always able to do is pique people's interest in history. Um, and so maybe you don't learn exactly the facts, um, but that may drive you to learn more about the Underground Railroad and find out more about this history. I'm just thinking of my own, I'll just tell a personal story. The first remembrance I have about learning about the Underground Railroad is a Disney um, TV show um, came on and um, it was about the Underground Railroad. It was about, um, why am I blanking on the name? I always remember the show. And of course, when I put on the spotlight, <laughs> you can't even get it anymore. But I, rem it, I watched that show and I was forever, that's my first impression of the Underground Railroad. Um, oh, it's going to bother me. And so I'll, you know, if somebody asks, I will send it because I even try to get a coffee because even though popular culture may get the historical details, I think sometimes we get, you know, as historians, we can get so bogged down into the minutia of what history is. But sometimes the bigger ideas are what's important. Like in that particular TV show, right? They're talking about, you know, people escaping, people relying on, you know, they go to a free African-American community. So it shows that. It shows this larger thing about cooperation, multiracial cooperation. It shows the things of Black agency. So I think sometimes we shouldn't get bogged down in kind of the historical minutia of popular culture, but look at the larger ideas that they're telling us that are really relevant to the history and the stories that we're trying to tell, because I think those impact, um, impact people in ways that really can be profound. And um, I'm just thinking, I love popular culture personally. Um, and so I'm not, the, you know, sometimes, you know, I get so disappointed and then I just have to like take a moment and go relax, really release, and then go, what is the larger cultural work that these things are doing that I may be not able to do as a historian? And in that way, I think they can really be provocative and do something really um, intentional um, that really kind of spark people's interest in history. So I never want to belie popular culture. I've actually created a list of almost every TV show, every movie that in any way deals with the Underground Railroad. I mean, we see the Underground Railroad in shows like The Simpsons. We see, you know what I mean? Like it teases people's interest and maybe it gets someone to think about something in ways that they would not get from going to a historic site or from reading an academic book. So it can really be exciting. So I'm not one to poo-poo popular culture. I know people are upset about this being an actual railroad, but if we look at like what is happening at some of those stops, what are the larger concepts that he's trying to talk to us about both um, enslavement and black freedom and the history of racism in our country, those are really um, interesting and thought-provoking things. All right. Well, if we were playing trivia tonight, we, we phoned a friend. Uh, the, it was a 1987 Disney movie of the week on the old Disney Sunday night movies. Uh, it was called The Liberators. Thank you. That is it. That is it. <laughs> Did you call them that yourself, Joe, or does that come from the audience? Uh, it, it, uh, well, you know, there's a little thing called Wikipedia. You know, uh. I know it's not the most, but for pop culture, you can usually rely on it pretty good. Plus, there's a section of Disney Wikipedia fandom. So I'm fairly, uh, and, and of course, as soon as you, and, and, and Mary just uh, responded saying uh, it was uh, the Liberators as well. Okay, a uh, couple of quick questions uh, or comments here. Uh, M Margaret says, I'm so glad I got to see this program tonight. I found out how much I've never heard about. As a kid long ago, my vision was basements and sneaking to the next stop in the dark. That was from school and even from sites I visited. So thank you for the enlightenment there. Of course, Mary chimed in just as I was giving the answer. She uh, knew it too, the liberators from Disney. But here's a good one from uh, Missy. Uh, and I think the three of you would probably have at least one or two ideas here. Uh, a lot of folks wanting to get their summer reading going here. Missy says, are there any books that you would recommend to learn more about the Underground Railroad, and in particularly the Underground Railroad in Illinois? Hmm. Well, as Turner's book, 
uh, right, Dave, on Illinois. I, I can't think of the name. Lynette Tilly Turner. Um, it's called the Underground Railroad in Illinois. Okay, there you go. I knew it. <laughs> it's a bit on the nose. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they really went on a, out on a limb for that right, title. That's right. Um, yeah, and um, our friend there, um, Larry McClellan, has a uh, book that's out about the Underground Railroad in the Chicagoland area that I would say check out. Um, if you kind of, it depends what you are looking for, but you know, of course, um, there's a new book out by Jennifer L. Harbor, which is talking more about kind of the larger African American involvement in kind of the freedom struggle. And she had on the cover of the book is the underground um, that painting of um, Jones, um, Mary, um, John, and Mary Jones. Mm. And so that doesn't, it's not t completely focused on the Underground Railroad. But I think, you know, one of the things that a lot of scholars are starting to look at is that the Underground Railroad, um, people's participation, activism in the Underground Railroad was just one part of a larger activism. And so I think that's a, what a lot of books are teasing out. If you want to know more about African American um, communities involved in the Underground Railroad, Cheryl LaRoche's book. Um, uh, geographies of resistance is a good one. Um, I can send you, uh, if you email me, which I think they'll show our email at the end there, you can email me and I will send you our um, bibliography of some underground railroad reading. And of course, I would say, you know, one of the early essays on the underground railroad in Illinois is, of course, um, Larry Guerra's art uh, article on the underground railroad in Illinois. And, you know, he was instrumental in getting us to start looking at African-American agency in the underground railroad. So there's a lot out there, um, but those are just some that you could look at and I'd be happy to send you more. And, and I might add in there too, the, the, the Network to Freedom site contains, of course, the, the, the listing of sites all over the country, but also I think, Dave, isn't that right, that also some of the nominations that are scanned are available, the forms, and, and that's just... I mean, that's, that's data, but there's great narratives in there, too. Um, and excellent yeah. resources for teachers as well, I yes. would imagine, too. We yeah. always yeah. have a, a good number of educators watching, watching our yeah. programs. Yeah, so speaking of that. which, we have a few of those websites that uh, Tim and Day talked about. Here you can stay connected with the National Park Service. There's the uh, websites for the uh, National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. Also, you can check out uh, that on, on social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and YouTube. Likewise, for the Lincoln Home National Historic Sites website listed there, and you can find uh, more about the Lincoln Home National Historic Site at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. And uh, Tim, do you have a slide? Uh, Day mentioned her email address. Uh, do we have one on there? Oh, I think is the general email. If you go to our website, you can find my email there. Okay, so and we've got the uh, the general website for the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. So just go there and look for uh, Day Johnson's uh, uh, email address, and she'll be able to uh, get you uh, more information that she alluded to in just a moment. Well, uh, Day, Tim, Jake, very informative program as always tonight. Uh, any other final thoughts here as uh, we wrap up uh, this look at the Underground Railroad and the Illinois Freedom Project? Well, I just might might add on on the Illinois Freedom Project. They had talked about you know agency and and taking action on the part of, of of the folks historically, and so that's really a lesson that we want to pass along to young people today is that agency and and people you know who are in a situation who did not let that situation define them, and they 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 took action, did what they could to change their situation and the situation of those around them. So that's really one of the main lessons or, or what we're trying to convey with the Illinois Freedom Project, too, is using the stories of the past and places to inspire young people today. Fantastic. I think that's a great place to end it. Thank you all for joining us, uh, our panel tonight. And thank all of you for watching on Facebook around the state and around the country. Uh, be sure to uh, keep uh, updated on what's going on with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. Just go to our website, presidentlincoln.illinois.gov, and you can check on the events page to see all the great programs we have coming up, uh, both of uh, historical interest uh, related to the Lincoln legacy and the Civil War in Illinois history, but programs on education, uh, different uh, avenues for your children to learn and enrich themselves about the history of Lincoln and uh, Illinois, all right there for you on the events tab at uh, presidentlincoln.illinois.gov. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great evening, and we'll see you soon from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, Illinois.